How many of you have had a chance to see this, Jesus Revolution? Okay, most of you have. Uh, I recommend it. If you haven't, uh, make sure you get a chance to watch it. Cindy and I didn't get to see it until about uh, three, four weeks ago, and it was very powerful, very inspiring, uh, very heartwarming, and I, I love the phrase, probably my favorite phrase from the whole movie was in this trailer when he said, um, they are searching for all the right things in all the wrong places. <clears throat> and um, thank you, uh, God, that we know the way and the truth and the life. Now we just need to reflect that well uh, so that others can see and, and have that same hope. There is a uh, research that Lori gave me this week, and I would refer you to the app notes uh, for this week. If you don't have the app, download it. Uh, Lake Gregory Church, and in the app is uh, more things, more scripture, more things to kind of meditate on. There are questions there for your reflection, and in there today, I refer to the reality that over the generations from all the studies of how people try to medicate and numb the pain or the disillusionment or try to fill the void of their boredom, that we just keep cycling through the same kinds of things. Now, we have new forms of old things to distract us and to try to keep our souls satisfied, uh, but it's basically the same stuff that your parents did and that their parents did and that every generation of people tries to fill uh, the emptiness in their, in their hearts. And the reality is that we are... We have the opportunity to be the most satisfied and the most free people on the planet by what Christ has done for us. He has provided the only way that that void can really be satisfied and that emptiness be lifted away and for us to find purpose and meaning and love and, and true satisfaction and true success. So, so that is uh, what we're going to reflect on today and apply it to our life. We are in a series called Detox, which is our eight heart attitudes for healthy church life, taking two of those a week, uh, because like I shared last week, everything that you do flows from your heart. That's not me, that's Proverbs 4.23 and statements of Jesus uh, throughout the New Testament. Everything that you do flows from your heart. If your heart is good, then your life will be good. If your heart is changed, then your behavior will change. And short time or long, you will become more and more like the one who created us in his image and his likeness. So let's pray together and let's ask that these two today, uh, pursuing purity and pursuing peace in our relationships, that uh, this will be encouraging and equipping and transforming for us. Father, uh, the only way that that can be is if you bless us with your presence here today and that you um, help us by your spirit push aside the things that distract us and that hinder us from a healthy walk with you and with each other and others. So would you please speak into our hearts today. Let us hear you. Let us see you. Let our hearts be touched by you, and may our walk be transformed by you, in Jesus' name, amen. Uh, I showed that clip because uh, it does show what every, every generation goes through in their search uh, for meaning and purpose, and one of the purposes that God has for us is that our hearts can really be free. Uh, he wants our hearts to be clean. He wants our hearts to be pure. Um, we're going to take a look at the, in the Sermon on the Mount, uh, Matthew chapter 5 and verse 8. Uh, the very first scripture I want to refer to in this idea of living pure is that Jesus said in his teaching to all of those crowds of people that were gathered around and searching for something, he said, blessed are the pure in heart for they will see God. Uh, this is what has to happen. There has to be a restoration of our lives from the inside out so that we can be restored relationally to God, so that we can see God. And oftentimes that's twisted to mean 
that, well, we've got to, you know, really get our act together and live great lives. And as we live good lives, then we will be worthy of being able to be in the presence of God. And it's such not the gospel. That is not the good news. Every human heart realizes how far short we fall of the glory of God. And it was only going to be through a new birth, a radical spiritual restoration, that God would be able to win our hearts to trust him and that we could be uh, able to see him and be with him uh, for all of time. Uh, let me just underscore this idea. Uh, let's go to 2 Corinthians 7, 1. And in chapter 7, verse 1, it says, Therefore, since we have these promises that God wants to be our Father, He wants to be in relationship with us, He wants us to know Him and experience His goodness, uh, since we have those promises, dear friends, Paul says, let us purify ourselves from everything that contaminates body and spirit, perfecting holiness out of reverence for God. We, we ought to be a set-apart people. If our hearts are won back to God and we're back in communion with Him, forgiven through what Christ has done for us on the cross, then we ought to live free. We ought to live clean. We ought to live pure. And we ought to pursue that. And there is a process that we go through. I saw it in my own life. I experienced it in my own life, the journey of growing and, and becoming more of who Christ wants me to be. I'm still on that journey, and so are you if you've come to faith in Christ. And if you haven't entrusted your life to Christ, God is inviting you to this place in Him where you can be restored, and you can be at peace with Him, and your heart and your desires can be rightly directed. And so... Um, that's 2 Corinthians 7 1. This is a prayer. I'm just going to quote this one. The Apostle Paul to the Philippian church said, This is my prayer that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight, so that you may be able to discern among all the good things what is really best, and that you may be pure and blameless until the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and the praise of God. So he's writing to people who have entrusted their lives to Jesus. They've experienced forgiveness. They now have the lights on and their desires are being, they're being motivated from the inside out, from the heart out to want to be the people that God created them to be. And so Paul's prayer is just, I just pray that that happens all the more that God may fill you with his love and his goodness and that you may be pure and blameless until the day of Christ. In 1 John chapter 3, verse 3, another apostle uh, says, uh, everyone who has this hope in them, this hope that Christ has secured for us, purifies themselves just as he is pure. This is the evidence, one of the evidences, that a person has truly come to know Christ is they can't stay the same. God motivates inward change. And if you don't follow that path, this is, the, this is the difficult place for the carnal Christian, is to be in that place where they know the truth and they have been, in a sense, set free by that truth, but they're choosing to continue to live in the world like the world lives. And I, I think that is the most miserable person on the planet, is the person who knows the truth but is choosing to live a lie contrary to that truth and is trying to satisfy the ache of the soul through every other means that humanity has devised to try to be at peace. And so um, Jesus has invited us to a different pathway, and that, and that pathway is the truth, uh, part of that pathway to freedom and purity is the truth. The word for truth in the language of the New Testament is a compound word. It's made up of the word not and the word hidden. Not hidden. Not concealed. It is being able to see things the way that they really are and being able to adjust one's life to the way that things really are. And in our culture right now, there is confusion about what truth is. 
truth has become relative. It is self-determined, and usually it's based on one's experiences and feelings about those experiences and decisions that we make about what is going to be truth. And it's become so in progressive culture, it's become so radicalized that uh, if you violate someone else's truth, then you are evil, okay? So there is your truth, what you deduce as truth, and there is my truth and somebody else's truth, and all of those viewpoints are equally valid. Well, that is completely illogical. Let me share with you a story that I read this week that kind of illustrates Uh, the lack of sound reasoning. Not everything can be true. There is one reality, okay? And that is what God has revealed and has made known in the person of his son, Jesus. So let's imagine that we're going to go for a hike this afternoon. And we get on this hike, and I brought my, my camel pack and you know, I've, I've got plenty of water for the hike, and, and you were kind of more freeloading. You took a half-empty water bottle and stuck it in your back pocket, and we're out on this hike. And you're just enjoying the journey, and you're just, you're feeling like this is the most wonderful thing. It's 74 degrees, it's sunny, it's beautiful, we're on a walk, we're out in God's creation, and this is great. And your truth is, everything is fine. We're safe, we're enjoying this. You need to relax. Okay, so that's your truth. My truth is, is that you didn't bring enough water, and so you're going to want some of mine, and not only are you going to be thirsty and in risk of dehydration, so am I, okay? And, but the reality is, is that you've walked down a trail that has separated a mountain lion from her cubs, and she is irritated and angry. Neither of us are going to need our water, okay? That's reality, That's the way that things really are. And truth is truth. And God has revealed truth and has made it so unavoidably stark through Jesus' sacrifice of himself. And that is the truth that we should align with our lives with. The Creator has a vantage point on our living that is different, that is true. And when we align ourselves with God's wisdom, God's truth, then we begin to experience the cleanness and the way, the life that is on this path in relationship with Him. So, I invite you to that purity. And and here's just a little side benefit of that. This is John Eldridge in a a book called Beautiful Outlaw. We've had several groups go through uh, this book as a study. And he says, uh, you know, we typically think of integrity as the ability to resist temptation by resolve. And that's a good thing. Self-discipline is a good thing. But there is another level of integrity, the kind where you don't even want the seduction that is being presented to you. Goodness runs so deep, so pervasive through your character and your being that you don't even want it. We respect the man who is able to reject sexual temptation. But how much more the man whose soul is such that he does not want any woman but the woman he loves and is married to. And this is what God is this is where God is wanting to take us. This is what this heart attitude is all about is that I need to be oriented, like we talked last week, the cockpit of my life. In that cockpit, I need to be so oriented to the way that God sees things and what is reality that I don't want any other path. I can tell you that oftentimes this is a motivator for me to make the right choice because I've made so many bad ones throughout my lifetime that I just really have lost the taste for that. And so it changes you when you see God's faithfulness and you experience his presence satisfying your heart, then it becomes an antidote to all the things that the world says you must do or you're going to be empty. And so pursue uh, purity.
heart attitude number three. That leads into heart attitude number four, which is to pursue peace in our relationships. Uh, Matthew chapter five, verse nine. It's interesting that in the Beatitudes in Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, that um, this statement on purity follows. Now, in case you think that, um, you know, you wonder where these heart attitudes came from, uh, you don't have to look any farther than Jesus' teaching. Jesus said there are certain attitudes of heart that you should have. Uh, that one that I already mentioned in verse 8, blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. You want to have a clean heart. Uh, verse 9 says, blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. So, again, this change of heart will become evident in that you will be pursuing peace <coughs> in every other relationship that you have. Out of the overflow of the peace that you experience with God, you will pursue peace. You will be a peacemaker. It evidences our heritage as children of God. Uh, Psalm 85.10 says, uh, Love and faithfulness meet together. Righteousness and peace kiss each other. There's a connection between right living and right relationships because all those things that bring brokenness to relationships are being dealt with. And so it gives us the opportunity to build greater trust. There's a greater love because there's a greater faithfulness, righteousness, and peace in the imagery of the psalm are, are companions on this journey. If you have a heart that's right with God, then you will be in a better posture and position to have right relationships, healthy relationships with other people. Uh, Romans chapter 12 verse 18 says, as much as it depends on you, live at peace with everybody. Work at peace. The true Christ follower pursues peacemaking in their relationships. It doesn't guarantee that there will always be peace, but we should be pursuing it. Jesus said that there's going to be a lot of times when there's conflict and division and struggle, but we should be people who are in pursuit of God's peace in our own heart and in our relationships. Uh, here's one that would be worth turning to, uh, 2 Timothy 2 and verse 22, and I want to read starting in verse 20 leading into it. Uh, the Apostle Paul is making an analogy about our lives, the interior of our lives, like the interior of of your house, okay? So he's saying, I'm, I'm talking about the inside of your life, and he says, uh, in a large house, there are articles not only of gold and silver, but also of wood and clay. Some are for special purposes, and some are for common use. Those who cleanse themselves from the latter will be instruments for special purposes, made holy, useful to the master, and prepared to do any good work. Now, what he's saying is, is God is about cleaning up the inside of the house, his dwelling place in you, okay? And there's some stuff that's got to go that's not clean, and there's some stuff that needs to be furnished on the inside that will put you in a good position to be a welcoming pres a, a welcoming dwelling for God, okay? He lives in you. If you've committed your life to Christ, it says that the Holy Spirit of God lives in you. And so um, he's going to, you know, point out the mold and the stuff that's, you know, been in the garbage too long that's stinking up the house. And, you know, he's going to be pointing out that stuff. It's just the nature of a walk with God. And he's going to be calling us to choose to carry the garbage out, to clean up the mold, to disinfect, to sanitize the dwelling. Through Christ, only Christ in you is this possible. This isn't you on your best behavior. The gospel is not the, go the gospel of behavior management. It is the gospel of a transformed heart, a changed heart. So uh, he wants to uh, do that in you. Now look at the connection uh, with this pursuit of peace. He says, flee, verse 22, the evil desires of youth and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace, along with those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. It's out of a pure heart 
that you're going to want to pursue peace. So the statement that I put in the slides there, right living and our experience of peace and relationships go together. Uh, This morning, I was reading in the second half of Romans 13, and uh, I wrote myself a little note here because the greatest motivator for the best behavior is love. The Spirit of Christ living in you, the love of God, you being secure in the love of God, knowing that you're forgiven, knowing that you have a new restored relationship with Him, and you being free to, to live fully, healthy, whole in relationships with other people. Love is the best motivator because in Romans 13 it says that if you love your neighbor like yourself, then it fulfills all the commands that God ever gave for our relationships with one another. Love becomes the motivator, the love of God in our hearts. So be secured by that love. Enter into the process. When God brings up things in your life that he wants to cleanse, it's only because he cares about you. And he wants the stuff that is toxic for your soul to be displaced by the things that are healthy. Just like the couple here yesterday uh, poured sand into a container, two different colors of sand, uh, kind of symbolizing their unity. You know, we had unity candles and unity crosses. Now we have unity sand. And they uh, poured that together. And it's going to be a reminder uh, somewhere in their home of their lives still being distinct and as individuals, but mixed and joining their lives together. It was a real beautiful uh, analogy. But all of that sand being poured into that vessel filled it up. And God wants our lives to be filled with the things that bring life and are healthy and help contribute to your being clear-eyed and able to see things the way that they really are. God wants that for you. And he loves you enough to say, we got to get the stinky garbage out. So let's do that. Let's do that next. And when you do that, then you'll be in a better position to be free to love other people. Most of sin, if not all of sin, impacts our relationships. It certainly always impacts our experience of our relationship with God, but it also impacts the quality of our relationships with others. When we're dealing with the stinky stuff and cleansing the house and walking in open eyes and open heart, a clear heart with God, then trust can form. Deeper relationships can happen because it's now safe to do so. Does that make sense? So, pursuing purity leads to a pursuit of peace. Now, in your app, I list for you some, uh, some suggestions for what to do when peace gets broken, trust gets broken. The Holy Spirit, I told a couple this week that the Holy Spirit is the only one who can throw the flag, like the official on the football field. You know, only the official has the right vantage point and is the one that has the authority to throw the flag and say, whoa, you know, grabbing that other person by the face mask and jerking them to the ground was not okay. So flag, there's going to be a penalty. We're going to set you back in in this progression here. And so uh, sometimes the Holy Spirit throws a flag. You said that inappropriate thing. You did that thing that you know isn't pleasing to God or it wounds a relationship with another person. And the Holy Spirit throws the flag, and you're under conviction. You realize, okay, that was not okay. So what do you do at that point? And in the app, I outline for you what would be the normal, healthy steps to take. Um, There are situations where these things are, um, uh, are not always possible, but it is always possible to go to God first. Um, And so, based on uh, Matthew chapter 7, verse 1, in the Sermon on the Mount, go to God first. Get the log out of your own eye. You know, it usually takes two to tango, and, um, you know, you may not have been the instigator of the offense, but you probably helped feed it. And so, you get alone with God, and you say, okay, I am really upset that this happened, you know, and and it doesn't matter whether you're the offender or the other person is the offender. Is it's just healthy to go to God. 
and ask him to give you perspective on what just happened. And then you're in a better posture to initiate. you got to take the initiative. And the scripture places the responsibility for initiative with whoever becomes aware of the conflict first. It doesn't matter if you're the offended or the offender. See, a lot of times conflicts go on and on and on because someone is offended, but they are waiting for the other person to take the initiative to clear it up. They ought to know how bad that was and how much that hurt. But the scripture says it doesn't matter. It's whoever becomes aware of the problem. You get with God. You get your heart in a good posture, a good place. You own your own stuff. And you take the initiative to seek to have a conversation with the other person. Again, there are situations where that isn't possible. Uh, the other person has to be willing, you know, for this process. And then uh, you humble yourself. You take ownership of your part. Uh, I told a couple this week that it's like taking bricks out of a wall that get built in between you. It doesn't get resolved by shouting at each other. That's like throwing hand grenades over the brick wall at each other. Well, you know, you this, and well, yeah, but you that. And so then there's this wall between you. But the way the wall comes down is when the first person, whoever it is, on either side humbles themselves and acknowledges something that they did that contributed to the problem. And when they humble themselves, it's like taking one of the bricks off the wall. And it gives the other person a different vantage point to, oh, okay, well, yeah, I was out of bounds too. Another brick comes off the wall. And the first thing you know, and I've seen this happen within 24 hours, couples that were ready to go to the court for a divorce, and one person humbled themselves and started this process of taking the bricks out of the wall. And uh, my parents were one of those. And uh, it's miraculous what God can do when we humble ourselves and take ownership of our part of the problem. Confession needs to be in the smallest circle possible. Uh, one of the worst things you can do is to go around to eight others and say what your husband did to offend you and then get it reconciled with your husband. And then there's eight other people out there that are like, hey, I ain't going to trust him. I'll never do business with that guy. You know what I mean? And all of a sudden, you've got eight other fractured relationships. Keep the conflict in the smallest circle possible. Nobody should be involved in that circle unless they are a part of the problem or a part of the solution. Okay? And that you can take a look at Matthew 18. And uh, seek forgiveness, not understanding. The first step is to clear the air and to forgive and take ownership of your wrongs. Usually what people do is, I am so sorry that I lost my cool, but I was up all night and, you know, I didn't sleep good and then this happened and my mother-in-law called and this thing was going on and that thing wouldn't work and, you know, all that. You've just completely diffused the impact of asking for forgiveness. Forgiveness is saying, I was wrong. I'm sorry. Please forgive me for that period. Now, there may be a time to have a conversation to gain understanding as you're working towards maybe more a fuller reconciliation, but it's not at the point that you're asking for forgiveness. And um, in seeking peace, it may be that you have to make restitution. If you borrowed $500 from somebody and you haven't paid it back, they're probably not going to hear you. I'm so sorry I didn't pay that money back to you. Will you please forgive me? <laughs> pay me back, <laughs> you know. Uh, make restitution, you know. Try as much as you can. Try to make restitution to bring peace in the relationship. And then seek ultimately the goal. The goal of God is the restoration of the relationship. But that goal is not always possible because it takes both sides and in some situations, that would be a very bad course to go down in the example of an abusive relationship. You know, you can forgive and you can clear the air, but you do that at a distance and you keep a boundary uh, because reconciliation is a whole other level of restoration than forgiveness.
Let's pray. Let's pursue purity, uh, lives that are clean, and let's pursue peace in our relationships with others. Father, thank you for meeting with us in these moments and encouraging us uh, to uh, maybe take out the garbage, um, maybe in some other way, maybe just an affirmation that this is the way to life. Wow, I want to live on this path where I'm free and enjoying your peace. So, uh, Lord, whatever you're speaking to each one, uh, that's your prerogative. I pray that you'll just help them to take whatever next step that they need to take to seek purity for their own heart and that to seek peace in their relationships with others. In Jesus' name, thank you. Amen.